This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. Would you turn with me this morning in your Bible to Romans chapter number 3. As you already know, Paul wrote the book of Romans about the subject of salvation itself. The entire book is a treatise on the subject of salvation. And Paul deals with a number of different aspects of of why we need to be saved, how we get saved, and what we should do after we're saved. There are a lot of different things in the book of Romans that, that deal with specific issues related to what in theological terms is called soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. I want to address one particular aspect of that this morning, though. So if you're able to, would you please stand with me out of respect for God's Word as I read our text this morning, which is only one verse long, but it's a verse that you're probably already familiar with, and I hope it's a verse you've already committed to memory. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says this, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This, of course, is one of the verses we use in the Romans road when we're trying to win someone to Christ. We have to get someone to realize that they are a sinner before they realize they need a Savior and that there is a need to be saved. Uh, This is probably one of the verses I've used more than any other verse in my time as a soul winner. It's one of the first verses I learned as a soul winner. But I want to talk to you this morning about the subject that is dealt with in verse 23. For all have sinned. Man has a problem. And it's a big problem. In fact, it's the source of every problem. I'd like to bring a message to you this morning entitled, The Nature of of sin. Dear Heavenly Father, please take the reading of Your Word. And Father, I pray, help us through the Holy Spirit to understand it exactly the way that You intend it. Lord, help us to interpret it with Scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept. And Lord, help us not just to know it academically, but to understand it, to understand its significance for us and for all those around us. Dear God, I pray You'd help us to be better soul winners, But Lord, help us too to be better children of the King because of our understanding of the nature of sin. For it's in Jesus' name and for His sake we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. I can remember when I was a teenager and then shortly after that in college, I became friends with one of the missionary families that our church supported. They were actually a missionary family out of the church I attended uh, as a senior in high school and then my college years too. They were missionaries to Mexico. They had previously been missionaries to the Philippines and they were veteran missionaries, but they were back home on furlough from the mission field for a year and I got to know them very well. I got to know the uh, the mother and the father, who of course significantly older than me, I was. They actually had a daughter that was older than I was at the time, uh, but I was the age of their children, more or less. And I can remember having several conversations with Brother Jim Joins, that missionary to Mexico. And one of the questions that I asked him as we were having a meal one time, I said. Brother Jim, I've heard all the stories about how the Aztecs and the Mayans and those in Central America used to offer sacrifices, human sacrifices, back before they learned of the true and living God of the Bible. And I said, I have always thought it curious why they offered sacrifices either of infants or virgins. I said, why why is that? Why did they do that? And he, of course, had been, like I said, not only a veteran missionary in Mexico, but also years before that in the the islands there in the Philippines. And he said, uh, said, that's a good question. He said, I've had other people ask me that. He said, I think I know the answer from having spoken to them about their culture and about their history. 
He said the reason that their ancestors offered child sacrifices or virgin sacrifices is because even though they were unsaved pagans who had never heard the gospel, they had at least a, enough of an understanding of the true religion all the way back to the Tower of Babel that they knew that it took a blood sacrifice to atone for sins. And they also knew that it took a pure blood sacrifice to atone for sins. And humanly speaking, the closest that they could come to an innocent, sinless human blood sacrifice was an infant child or a virgin. He said that's why they offered those sacrifices to pay for the sins of their people, their whole tribe, uh, their whole civilization. Periodically, they would offer a number of infants and or a number of virgins to atone for the sins of the people. And you know, I have never forgotten what Brother Jim Joins, that missionary to Mexico, told me when he answered that question. Because even those in the, the deepest, darkest reaches anywhere around the world who are still in... Uh, pagan idolatry have some understanding of that basic concept that sin must be paid for. And this morning I want to talk to you about the nature of sin. Now I'm going to share some doctrinal things with you, but my my goal this morning, my desire this morning is to try to answer some questions along the way this morning that, well, quite frankly, I think are sometimes difficult questions And a lot of people, I don't think, know the answers to some of the questions with which I'm going to deal this morning. So I want to try to give you a better understanding of the nature of sin and answer some questions that maybe you have, maybe you've never even thought of before, that you will have a better understanding when you leave this place this morning. So that when you talk to other people, perhaps it will open a door for you to be able to win someone to Christ just by explaining to them what the Bible says about sin in one area or another. Now I want to tell you that when I get to the end of the message this morning, my intention is to share with you some very positive, uplifting things, even about the nature of sin and sin in our lives. So whether a person listening to this message is lost and not yet saved, or whether you're already saved, there's something good at the end of the message. So... Let's begin the nature of sin. First of all, I have spent a good deal of time over the last year preaching several different messages that dealt with where sin comes from, at least as far as the human race is concerned. And that is original sin, the sin that began with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit off the tree of the knowledge of uh, of good and evil uh, in disobedience to God, That was the original sin. And the doctrine of original sin then says, uh, from what we read in Romans chapter 5 from the Apostle Paul, that because of that sin, every subsequent generation of mankind has inherited that sin nature from their fathers. Specifically the fathers. Now again, as I've said many times before, you ladies are not without sin either. You might be a little sweeter than we are, but you're not without sin either. But you inherited your sin nature from your fathers, just like we inherited as men our sin nature from our fathers. So uh, women have a sin nature, but they got it from the same place we men got it, from your father. And that's the necessity of the virgin birth, is that Jesus is physical father had to be God so that he could be at the same time man, but a sinless man. So his father is God. He did not inherit the sin nature that comes through the bloodline through any human father. So that's a little bit about original sin and the transmission of sin from one generation to the next. You inherit a You inherit the effects of original sin and the sin nature, uh, just like you inherited your eye color, your hair color, how big or how short you are, how, uh, you know, how intelligent or not intelligent, all of those things that we think of related to genetics and DNA. You also inherited the sin nature from your parents, specifically from your father. And so I've 
preached a number of messages that dealt with original sin and the transmission of original sin from generation to generation. I've done that a number of times in the not too recent past. So my message this morning is not about original sin and the transmission of sin from one generation to the next. That's, that's pretty much all I'm going to say about that. Instead, my message this morning is about the nature of sin. What is sin? Where does it come from? And a lot of other questions that, as I said, maybe you've wondered what the answers were before. Maybe you've never even thought of some of these questions. But if you did think of them, you might not know what the answer is. So my desire this morning is to answer some sometimes difficult questions about sin from the Word of God. So, sin is not the absence of good. I think sometimes people think that sin is just the absence of goodness. That's not the case. Sin is not just the absence of good or goodness. It is an intentional, overt act of the will. Sin is intentional disobedience. Sin doesn't just happen, it's a choice. You say, well, preacher, I I ended up doing something wrong uh, one time and I didn't really intend to do it wrong. No, at some point you made a choice and that's what sin is. Sin is an intentional overt act of the will to disobey God. Now, I want to try to answer some of those difficult questions about sin this morning. And uh, before I do that, though, I want to give you an idea of some of the different expressions in Scripture that are used to describe what sin is. The first one is the same as what we read in Romans 3.23 in our text this morning. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The, The word that is used for sin here is the word that is used most often for sin in the New Testament... It's the Greek word uh, hamartia. It comes from the verb hamartano, which means to miss the mark. Picture, if you would, an archer with a bow and arrow who is aiming at a bullseye, and when he shoots and lets the arrow fly, the arrow flies to one side or the other of the target, but it doesn't strike the target at all, let alone hit the bullseye. He has missed the mark. That is the word most often used for sin in the Greek language in the New Testament. Hamartia. Hamartano. To miss the mark. It's used 221 times in the New Testament. And you know, that's that's a good understanding of what sin is because God has something He wants us to to do, to live, to be, that's the bullseye. But because of the choices we make, instead of doing what God wants us to do, and because of that sin nature we inherited from our fathers, all the way back to Adam and Eve, we have a tendency to miss the mark. I mean, let's face it, the verse in our text said, for all have sinned. That means every one of us has missed the mark. Well, what's the mark? What's the bullseye? The mark is holiness, righteousness. God said in the Old Testament, and He repeated it in the New Testament when Peter said, uh, Be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. You see, God is not neutral. He is holy. Everything about Him is good, right, righteous. He is holy, but we're not. If all the decisions we made, all of our actions, all of our thoughts were only holy, only righteous, we would hit the mark. But because of that sin nature we've inherited from Adam and Eve, none of us have hit the mark. We've all come short of the glory of God. Oftentimes, especially when I'm witnessing to a child, trying to lead a child to Christ, I will explain that this verse is saying that we're all sinners. And that sin is anything you do that's bad. And that the Bible is telling us that because we're sinners, because we have sin in our heart, we don't deserve 
to be with God because God is holy. He's perfect. He's without sin. And if I have sin, I don't deserve to be with Him. And so that's what the, the word hamartia means, to miss the mark. Here's another word or expression that the Scriptures use for sin. That is the word crooked. Now, I know Brother Kevin used to work when he was a teenager at Planter's Warehouse there in McDonough. Uh, I grew up not far from there too and bought all kinds of stuff from there, uh, both when I was growing up with my daddy and then when I got old enough to be a customer myself. But there at Planter's Warehouse, they would from time to time, uh, they would either sell or give away yardsticks that had planters stamped on it with the address and the phone number and all that on there. And at my great aunt and uncle's house, who also lived in McDonough, up in their attic, I found two yardsticks they had gotten from planters and those those two yardsticks had probably been in the attic, Brother Kevin, over 50 years. I do not know for sure how long they had been there, but for many, many years, decades, they had just been up there in the attic. Well, one of those yardsticks had fallen over and was just lying flat on the floor. And Brother Jim, it was just as straight as the day I guess they made that yardstick. But one of the yardsticks had been leaning in the corner up there in the attic for 40, maybe 50 years. And that yardstick uh, looked just like this. Uh, Those that are listening but not able to see me, it, it had a bow in it where it had been leaning against the wall in the corner for so many years. And if you took those two yardsticks and stood them up side by side, while one of them was straight as an arrow, but that other one, boy, you could tell it was really out of being straight. It was rounded. It was curved from leaning against the wall there for so many years. Crooked. That yardstick is a a perfect illustration of how we are compared to God's standard of righteousness. His standard of righteousness is straight. We, next to it, are crooked. In fact, we're worse off than that planter's yardstick was. It just had one big bend in it, one bow in it. We're just crooked all over like an old crooked stick that you find in the woods. That's one of the the words that's used for sin in the New Testament is the word crooked. It's used in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. In Psalm 125 verse 5, the Bible speaks about the crooked and perverse generation. In Philippians 2.15, the Bible talks about uh, the sin in our lives in which we are crooked compared to God. Another expression in the Scriptures for sin is the word transgress. The word transgress is, well, it's a word you can use not just for sin. The word is taken from a, a prefix, which is trans, And gress, gress means to go or to move. Trans means across something. Uh, If you have a Trans-America pipeline, that's a pipeline that goes all the way across America. Well, to, to transgress means to cross a line. And that's what sin is. Sin means to cross the line. What line? Well, the line God has drawn and says, this is right and this is wrong, don't cross the line. It's the same line that your mama and daddy drew for you uh, metaphorically when they said, don't cross me. This is the rule. This is the line. Don't cross the line. A transgression is crossing the line. That is uh, going across the line that God has established. And the word transgress or transgression is used many times in both the Old Testament and the New. In 2 Chronicles 24, 20, God speaks of our transgressions. In 1 John 3, verse 4, again, uh, our transgressions are before the Lord. So transgress means to cross the line, to step over the line that God has drawn and said, don't cross. Another word or expression for sin in Scripture is the word iniquity. Now, iniquity is not a word we typically use for anything other than talking about God and about the Bible. The word iniquity means an impurity. 
It means it's not pure. You know the old uh, adage about ivory soap, 99.9% pure. I think Charlie Pride had a song along those lines to go with that way back in the 70s. But iniquity means something is not pure. And let's face it, you could be 99.9% pure, but that's not pure. Pure means being right, holy, righteous, 100% of the time. I've used the illustration in in messages in days gone by where I would have a a mason jar up here uh, at the pulpit and I would take just a little bit of dirt out of the back there and put it in the, the glass of water and then invite anybody that wanted to to come up and drink out of that glass of water that only had a little bit of dirt in it, but who wants to drink dirty water? I mean, it's either clean or it's not clean. Now, I know in reality, growing up, we probably ate more dirt than we would care to know, but the point is something's either pure or it's not pure. We are not pure. We have iniquity within us. We have impurities within us. The word iniquity conveys the thought that the very nature of whatever it is 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 not only impure, but it's, it's actually rotten. And that's what we are. There are numerous times in the Bible that the Word of God speaks of, uh, of iniquity. In Deuteronomy 32.5, uh, the word corrupt is used. It's the same as iniquity. We're corrupt. We're not pure. We're not holy. We have some impurities in us. Isaiah 64 verse 6 tells us that even our good works are as filthy rags before the Lord. Now if those are our good works that are as filthy rags, reckon what our bad works are like before a holy righteous God. Psalm 14 verse 3 and Psalm 53 verse 3 talk about filthy and filthiness. Colossians 3.8 talks about filthy communication, that is filthy language, filthy talking that comes out of, uh, out of a man. 2 Peter 2 verse 7 talks about a filthy conversation. You say, well, I thought you just mentioned that with communication. No, the word conversation here is more than just your speech. It is your lifestyle. And Peter is speaking of a filthy lifestyle. And I'm sorry to say I've known more than a few Christians who had a filthy lifestyle just like the lost crowd had a filthy lifestyle. It's because of iniquity, impurity. And then the final word that I'll use as as an expression for sin, and, and there are actually others, but another one is disobedience. Crossing the line is disobedience. Missing the mark is disobedience. Being impure is disobedience. But disobedience itself means being insubordinate. It means being in rebellion to what you know is right. The Greek word is parakoia. It's found in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 6 and a number of other places where the Bible talks about disobedience obedience. So all of those are are good descriptions of what sin is. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Whether you want to think of it as missing the mark or transgressing and crossing the line or being impure or being rebellious and defiant and insubordinate and committing disobedience, all of those are descriptions of sin. And every man, woman, boy and girl who is able to understand the difference has committed sin. So now let's talk about those questions. We know what sin is. We know why man has it. Well, let's address some of the the questions that maybe you don't know the answer to about sin. Let me start with this one. What makes something sin? And that's a fair question. The Bible tells us numerous things that are sins in the sight of God. 
So a very fair question might be, well, what makes it sin? Well, the answer to that is that anything that goes against the character of God is a sin. You see, sins are based upon what His attributes are and what they're not. Let me explain it this way. He's the Creator, we're the creation. Because He's the Creator, He gets to make the rules. And whatever His attributes are, are those things that are good, those things we should follow, those things we should pursue. Anything that is a violation of His attributes is a sin. Why? Because He's the Creator. And we as the creation have an obligation to please the One who made us. He gets to make the rules. The rules are His attributes. His attributes are what result in His commands to mankind. Whatever His attributes are, that's what He commands of us. He expects us to reflect Him because we're His creation. If you make something, it is a reflection of you. It's a reflection of who you are. Uh, Mamas and daddies, grandmas and grandpas, those children, whether you uh, like it or not, and whether it's for the good or the bad, they are a reflection of who we are as parents, because our children were made in our likeness. They were made in our image. Just like Adam was made in the image of God, we were made in the image of our parents. That's why it's procreation, not an act of original creation. But because we are His creatures, His creations, His commands line up with what His attributes are. Well, what are some of His attributes? Well, He's good. He's holy. He's loving. And on and on we could go with who God is, what He is like, what are His moral attributes. Well, those are His commands to us. And His commands reflect who He is. Thus, the need for us also to follow those commands and to reflect those attributes. We should eschew evil, disdain evil, stay away from evil in order to follow His commands because His commands reflect who He is and we are His creation. So what makes something sin? It's because it goes against the attributes of God. By the way, Some would ask, well, did he know man was going to sin? I think you already know the answer to that. The Bible is very clear. In Revelation 13, verse 8, the Bible tells us, as it does in numerous other places in the New Testament, that the Lamb of God was slain from the foundation of the world. That is, God had already decided before He ever created the the earth that He was going to send His Son to the cross. Why? Because he saw in his foreknowledge before he ever created man and before he ever created the earth that man would sin and he would need to provide a means of salvation to restore mankind, to redeem mankind. So yes, God knew about sin before he ever created the world, before he ever created Satan, before He ever created the angels, before He ever created man, God knew that man would sin. He knew that Satan would sin and rebel against Him. God knew, but He still chose to create the earth. He chose to create man. And He chose to create a plan of redemption. My, what love that is, that God would create man knowing well beforehand that He would have to send His only Son to die in our stead that we might be saved. So yes, in His knowledge, yes, He knew about sin before He ever created Satan, the angels, or man. Well, does that mean then, preacher, that God created sin? Does that mean that God is the author of sin. After all, He created Satan 
and He created man with the foreknowledge that we were going to sin. So doesn't that actually make God responsible for sin? Well, the answer, of course, is no. Sin doesn't have to exist in order for good to exist. There are those who buy into the pagan philosophies and pagan religions that say, well, you can't have evil without, or you can't have good without having evil. Well, that's a false philosophy. That's a false thought because God existed before anything else existed, and God is only good. You don't have to have evil for good to exist. But that dualism, the ancient religion of Zoroastrianism from Persia, uh, the, the philosophy in Star Wars of the, the good and uh, the, the good force and the evil force being at odds with each other and you can't have one without the other, the yin and the yang from Buddhism and Taoism. Uh, even Mormonism teaches some sort of concept of evil has to exist in order for there to be good. But this concept of dualism is not true. Evil doesn't have to exist. Sin doesn't have to exist in order for there to be good. In 1 Corinthians 14 verse 33, the Bible tells us that God is not the author of confusion. In 1 John 1 5, the Bible also tells us that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. God existed totally good totally righteous, totally pure, before there was sin. So no, God did not create sin, and sin doesn't have to exist. Sin is a creation of Satan and a creation of man. It's not a creation of God. So no, God did not create sin. God is not the author of sin, though He foreknew it, though He saw it in advance, He is not the one who created it. So then the next question, preacher, why does God allow sin? I mean, if He's the Creator, and He is, and He is all-powerful, and He is, why does He allow sin? I mean, couldn't He just stomp it out, cut it short the moment that it begins, so the world will perpetually stay without sin? Well, yes, He could do that. But why does He allow it then? Why does He allow it since we know He does allow it to continue? Well, the answer also is in Romans. In Romans chapter 5 where we read that whereas by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin for that death passed upon all men, uh, that original sin from Adam, it also tells us in Romans 5 verse 20, Moreover the law entered, that is the knowledge of sin, that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Why does God allow sin? God allows sin because sin, believe it or not, also reveals His grace more than it would have been revealed had the sin not abounded. That is... When man sins, and man does what God says to do to be forgiven of sin, then God forgives that sin and His grace abounds. His grace overflows more than it already was. Every time a sin is committed that is covered by God's grace, God's grace abounds it is more obvious than it was before that God is a gracious God. You see, when we get saved, we are trophies of His grace. All of us, our purpose is to get glory for God. That's our only reason for existing is to get glory for Him. So His grace in our lives makes us a trophy of grace. Why does God allow sin to continue? Because even sin gets glory for God. It doesn't get glory for Him because of it being wickedness. It gets glory for Him because it shows that His amazing grace can even cover another sin and another sin.
By the way, there were some of the first century Christians who took advantage of that. Paul says, turn that into licentiousness. And they said, well, if, if me sinning helps to show God's grace more than it did before, why, well, I guess it's good for me to just go out and sin all I want to sin after I get saved because I'm just helping God's grace uh, to be more abundant. Well, no, Paul calls that licentiousness taking license with something God has done for us. And Paul says that's wrong. But God allows sin because even sin reveals His glory. We are trophies of His glory. When we choose not to sin, that brings glory to God as well. And in spite of what my friends who are Presbyterians and uh, some of my Uh, Calvinist and hyper-Calvinist Baptist preacher friends would, uh, even though they have trouble with this, God made man a free moral agent with a free will to make a choice for himself. God did not make us robots, a bunch of automatons who have no choice. Where is the glory for the Creator if if the creation has no choice but to follow Him? to obey Him, to worship Him. There's a lot more glory for God when we, by choice, choose to worship Him, choose to follow Him, choose to obey Him. No, He doesn't want us to be robots, automatons. He wants us to worship Him and not sin out of our own free will because of our love for Him our devotion to Him. So sin gets glory for God, both when sin is committed and when sin is not committed. All right, preacher, here's the next one. And I guess as a pastor, this is one of the questions I've probably heard more than any other theological question. It's got to be in the top three. Preacher, since we are all born sinners like you've already proven from Scripture, does that mean that God condemns infants and those who are unable to understand with their mental faculties the difference between right and wrong? If they die without understanding and they were born with original sin, does God condemn them? After all, they were born with original sin. You know, I can remember as a boy growing up hearing people refer to a term, the age of accountability. I'm going to tell you as a preacher, I hate that term because everybody I ever heard use that term wanted to say that there was a preset age that was the age of accountability. Uh, If you go to the Methodist church or the Catholic church or this denomination or that denomination, they've kind of laid out in their belief system what age it is when somebody reaches the, quote, age of accountability. And if they die before that, they automatically go to heaven. If they die after that, it depends on whether they got saved or not. Well, I have heard a, a multiplicity of thoughts on what that age of accountability is. The Catholic Church for years and years, and perhaps still today, would tell you that the age of accountability is 12. Now I'm going to submit to you, I don't think I'm necessarily the the brightest bulb in the pack, but I know for a fact, I knew the difference between right and wrong a lot earlier than 12 years old. I'm looking around the room, and I think most of the people in this room this morning knew the difference between right and wrong before you turn 12 years old. So the idea of an age of accountability being a set age, that's definitely contrary to Scripture, and it definitely isn't 12 years of age. But I think it is a true statement that God only holds those accountable who have a knowledge of good and evil. And that before there's a knowledge of good and evil, at whatever age it is, that person reaches the understanding that there is a difference. Before that, they are innocent. Notice I did not say holy, I said innocent. Think of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. 
In the Garden of Eden, before Adam and Eve sinned, they were not holy like God. I mean, they were walking around naked before they ate the fruit off that tree. But as soon as they ate the fruit off the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what was the first thing they went and did? Well, they went and sewed themselves fig leaves together to hide their nakedness because they knew there was something innately wrong about being naked, at least parts of you. So they went and sewed themselves fig leaves together. It's because they had lost their holiness? No, they never had holiness. They had lost their innocence. Innocence is not holiness. Holiness is God. It means you're always right. You're always good. You're always pure. They weren't holy. They were just innocent. But God did not hold them accountable when they didn't know the difference between good and evil. They were innocent, but not holy. Listen to what the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in His sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Okay, well here's where, here's where someone changes from innocent to now they know the difference. We know with Adam and Eve it was when they ate the fruit off that tree. But for you and I today, that happens when we know the law. The Bible says, by the law is the knowledge of sin. Romans 3.20 Oh, preacher, now I've got you. I've trapped you. Preacher, I've heard you say before that all those people around the world that have never heard the gospel, they will still die and go to hell because of their sins. But preacher, they've not heard the law. They've, many of them have never seen a Bible. They've never heard the Bible. How could they have heard the law So they're still innocent. Ah, so all those liberal contemporary preachers were right. If they don't hear the gospel, God's going to take them on to heaven because they're still innocent. Nope. Wrong. Sorry. Because Paul also tells us in Romans that the law that he gave to the children of Israel, that is the written law that you and I hold in our hands here, that's not the only law that reveals sin to mankind. Preacher, what law is there other than what's recorded in the Bible? Well, listen to what Paul also said in the book of Romans, in Romans 2, verses 14 and 15. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves." which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So God says there's a law that is written that He gave to the children of Israel, and that's a law that brings the knowledge of sin, the knowledge of good and evil. But there's another law that even if someone's never read the law, they already have it in their heart. That is the conscience that God puts within every man, woman, boy, or girl that has the ability to understand. And that difference is the conscience. The Gentile nations, as Paul said, they didn't have the written law. But it was a law unto themselves because they knew in their conscience what was right and what was wrong. It goes back to what we were just talking about, that age of accountability. There's no specific age because it probably varies from person to person, but at the very moment in a person's life when they know the difference between good and evil, they cease to be innocent. And then they become accountable to God. That is the law. So when a child... When an infant dies, and you and I all know people who have lost infants at birth or shortly after birth, that infant was still innocent in the sight of God. Romans chapter 5 verse 13 I think speaks directly to that. 
It says, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. That means Adam and Eve were sinning when they were walking around naked before they ate that fruit. But the, the sin was not imputed that is put on their account until came the knowledge of the law. Well, the knowledge of the law came not by reading something, because God hadn't yet given it in writing. It came in their conscience the moment they knew the difference between right and wrong. That's why they went and sewed together those fig leaves. It is the knowledge of the law, the knowledge of the difference between good and evil that moves one from being innocent to being accountable. So no, the infant who dies is not condemned because there is no knowledge of the law, either from the written law or from their conscience. They're an infant. They know not the difference between right or wrong. So too, I am positive, are those who may not be an infant, but they do not have all the mental faculties to understand the difference between good and evil, choosing or not choosing. Well, preacher, how much sin is necessary to condemn someone to hell? How much sin does it take to be lost and on your way to hell? You already know the answer to this, but the answer is one. One sin is enough. Because having one sin means we are no longer holy. We're not pure. And if we want to spend eternity with God, sin must be removed. Sin must be taken out of the way. Only one sin is enough to condemn someone to hell. Why? Because God is holy. And in Him is no darkness at all. Romans 3.23, our text this morning said, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Even if we committed only one sin, we'd be down here in comparison to the holiness of God, which is no sin. By the way, the only sin that is required to send somebody to hell is the sin of not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to commit murder. You don't have to commit uh, adultery. You don't have to commit lying. You don't have to commit any of those specific sins we normally think of when we're thinking of sins. No, the only sin that is required to send someone to hell is the sin of not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to what Jesus Himself said to Nicodemus in John 3 verse 18. Two verses down from John 3 16. He that believeth on Him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You see, we start out condemned because of original sin, and it is believing on the Lord Jesus that moves us from death unto life. I have endeavored this morning to, to not only explain what sin is and where it came from, but to to try to answer some of the difficult questions that people sometimes wrestle with about sin. I want to conclude this morning with some very uplifting positive things about sin and, well, its effects upon you and I, whether you're saved or whether you're lost. If you're lost, the good news is that Jesus paid for your sins. And the Bible says, God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can be saved from your sin if you're lost just by believing that He paid for your sin. And by faith, believing that was for you. And asking Him to save your soul. But what about those that are listening that are saved. 
Most of you that are here this morning, perhaps everybody who's here this morning is already saved. What is the good news? What is the uplifting part about sin for you if you're saved? Well, the Bible tells us that God has dealt with sin, first of all. In Isaiah 53, the very famous passage in which we have revealed the crucifixion 700 years before it happened, In Isaiah 53, 5, the Bible says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and with His stripes we are healed. He paid the penalty for our sins. Why did He do that? Because He wants you and I to be saved. He wants a relationship with you personally. In, again, Isaiah, but in chapter 43, verse 25, listen to what God said. I, even I, am He that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. God said, I'm blotting out your transgressions for my sake. Why would God say He's blotting out our transgressions for His sake? It's because He loves us. It's because He wants fellowship with us. He intimately wants a relationship with you. And when you come to Him and receive Him as your Savior, it is, it is for His sake He's blotting out your sins. We selfishly think it's just about me but it's really about God as well as about you. King David said in the very famous Psalm, Psalm 51, when he was asking for forgiveness from God, he says in Psalm 51 verse 1, his prayer is that the Lord would blot out his transgressions. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness." According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. David was a saved man at this point. He wasn't a lost person praying to get saved. He was already a believer. He was already a man after God's own heart. But he asked God in his tender mercies to blot out his transgressions. And then, of course, Probably just as famous a verse in the psalm, Psalm 103 verse 12. The psalmist says, Lord, the Lord will remove our iniquities from us as far as the east is from the west. Friends, once you've been saved and once you've been forgiven of your sins, your sins are in God's mind as far as the east is from the west. Theoretically, if I remember in geometry class, a line goes infinitely in both directions. That's why there's a little arrow on both ends when you draw a line in geometry. It's because the east never meets the west. That's how far God removes our sins from us. He doesn't hold you accountable once you're forgiven. What great news, what glorious news for those that are saved. And the last verse I have, is from the prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament. In Ezekiel chapter 18, the prophet is talking about God forgiving sins. As soon as I can get there, I'll read the passage. Ezekiel 18 verse 31 says this, "...cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? Friends, this is God speaking to Israel because of their sins. He says to them, He commands them, Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. Dear friend, if you're saved, already born again, but you have sin in your heart or in your life,
The good news is that God can make within you a new heart, a new spirit from this day forward. If you're not saved by receiving Him as your Savior, beginning a personal relationship with Him, you can have a new heart and a new spirit. Would you stand quietly and reverently to your feet, please, with heads bowed and eyes closed. Miss Mary, if you'll come to the piano. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank You for the opportunity to talk about the subject of sin. Sin is never a fun topic on which to dwell, but dear God, we thank You that You've given us the rule book so that we won't be caught unawares. Lord, that we'll understand what the rules are, what's expected of us, and what You've done for us, even though we don't deserve it. Oh, dear God, I pray that You would take the message on sin today. I pray that all of our folks would better understand what sin is, from where it comes, and those things, the ways in which it affects our lives. Help us to to understand sin from a biblical perspective, from Your perspective. And may we live clean, holy, pure lives and be holy for You are holy. I pray that if there's anybody here this morning that's not saved, that Lord, this morning it'd be the morning they trust You as their Savior. And Lord, if there's anyone here that's already saved, but they've been dealing with sin, You've been dealing with their heart about sin, I pray this morning would be the day they would leave it at the altar confess their sins and walk away. Use this invitation, I pray. And with heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, Miss Mary, if you'll begin to play whenever you're ready.